saw in the previous tape, we did almost all of the cockpit detailing. There's a few things left to do, like the joystick, some hand painting, and some other little details. So let's get right over to the table and start cutting stuff. I have some telescoping pieces of aluminum tubing here, three sizes. I want to make up what will be the joystick. I'm just going to put a little to simulate the handle and then double up the size, put the next size bigger right on top of this so that I have what looks like the shaft and then the handle right on the top. Now that's not really scale. A scale Spitfire had a shovel type handle, but I don't want to even get into trying to make something like that. This is not a really a scale model, so I'm just going to make up a normal type of joystick here. Now with the third piece on here, it looked too hokey, so I left the... Of course, I'm going to paint this black. This is going to be like the rubber grip, and then I'll put a uh, the machine gun button on the top. I polished up the tubing with some 1200 sandpaper, and I want to make a little boot. So at, there's two reasons. Of course, to make it look more realistic and it, when it gets stuck in, but also to give it some support. So I want to carve that boot out of a relatively hard piece of balsa wood, not a soft piece, a hard piece, because that's going to support this. I tried to, uh, you know, do the carve and I found out it was just too delicate. So what I did, I made up some little circles out of balsa. And I'm going to try to work on these and see if I can make what looks like a boot out of this and also give that stick a little support. Now I'm going to get the sandpaper and just try to work some folded up sandpaper into these grooves. Try to make this look a little more like, well, it's off center, but doesn't matter. I'm going to taper it now. Machinist rule with some sandpaper folded up seems to cut the best here. And what I did, I shortened this stick and put some serrations in it so it'll get a better grip to the floor and to whatever sheeting it goes through. Believe it or not, this little detail does take a little more time than I thought it would, but I'm sure it's going to be worth it when it's all put together. that's ready to put in. Well, that's about all we're going to get to do today. The wife is calling, and I smell supper on the stove. today's mail. I got this nice tape dispenser from Joe Adamusco. Joe, thanks a lot, needless to say. And this definitely will add that one of the nice things is you can just, you don't have to be fooling and fooling. You can just go by, especially like what well, I could have used when putting on a top block or something. Boy, that could be very handy. I appreciate that a whole lot. I also got from my good friend Bill Zimmer, and this thing smells like pipe tobacco here. Karen's going to think I'm smoking a pipe. Another pizza polish shirt. <laughs> All right. Listen, Zimmer, this is serious now. I expect free pizza at the Nats this year. This is no kidding around. He's watching all these Spitfire videos. He's going to know more than me. He's going to fly better than me. I want pizza. Thanks a lot. Okay, back to work on a canopy. One of the things I want to do, I want to make some simulated supports that they're like a mirror image of this that come front to back. Maybe a piece across here. Still have to do. And I have a couple other pictures of cockpits. I want to try to steal some ideas and maybe get a couple more details made up on this today. I made up a little pattern. This is 16th plywood. Now, it, the reason it's plywood is it's very hard to make nice holes with these very thin ribs with balsa wood. And by using uh, the stone 
and trying to get the holes a little bit countersunk, it really has a realistic look. But again, the trick here is not to try to drill these holes with a drill, burn them through with a Dremel tool, make sure they're even, and use plywood, and you'll get nice little detailed parts. Now once I get the pattern the shape that I want, now I'll trace this out, duplicate it so I have the same piece on both sides. This is going to be a part that I want to be relatively symmetrical. doing this neatly is start from one side then burn it through back the other side. So it's countersunk on both sides. When you want to get those thin realistic ribs, that really has a real aircraft look. And go back and burn it from this side, try to get them all symmetrical and even. You try to drill holes, you'll never, you'll never get those thin ribs. Now, next thing, I'll get a coat of paint on these. While they're drying, I'll work on some of the other details. Now, it's a good idea, the side that you're not going to paint, the side that's going to get uh, glued, don't put any paint on it, of course. You get a, better, a little bit better glue joint anyway. And uh, an X-Acto number 11 blade, an old used blade, seems to make a good hold up. With the talcum powder in here, really one coat is all you need. And stipulize it, stipple it, and it'll give a nice flat finish with no brush marks. Now once they dry, we can install them in there, but in the meantime, I can be working on some of the other details. The next thing I want to make up is a like a simulated little radio. And of course this is just a piece of scrap. I've squared off all the edges and I want to cover this with aluminum. That same aluminum from the uh, the scapel blade covers. Now, the trick as always with these scapel blade covers is just you see how wrinkled this is, is to get the wrinkles out, just pull them straight to get out any of the little wrinkles that you can. But this leaves a nice, real dull aluminum. really has a realistic look. You wish you could make more of the cockpit detailing out of this aluminum. In fact, I'm going to see what else I can make. This really is a nice trick, by the way. I'm sure even scale builders like Bill Boss have come up with this idea. And I just got a little bit of thick CA waiting for that to kick off. And I'll wrap it around almost like I'm wrapping a package. Again, the real problem here is I don't have a real accurate picture of what's in that window compartment, but I'm assuming a radio would be one of the things that would be back there. And get the sides glued, and then I'll wrap this up. Now I'm simulating, trying to simulate some of the little riveting details with a ordinary T-pin. Again, it's aluminum, just, just really holds little rivet head details and things just beautifully. Make up a little antenna wire. Easiest way, and I, I did this four or five times before I came up with a satisfactory way. You really have to bend a spring. This is 032 wire. You really have to bend a complete spring. You see how I've got almost almost like threads in here. And then kind of bend it back. Well, you don't get the last little bit of the curve. And I want that to be the radio antenna wire. I 
made this out of scrap balls and just covered it with that that uh, the lead. Well, I guess it's lead, tin, whatever. Just letting this glue kick off now. Make sure I got this quadrant glued in, and I'll find a spot on the dashboard for this. I put a couple of rivet heads on there with the pin. We just dressed it up just a little bit. I got the antenna on there, radio. Now with, <clears throat> with an ink pen I did, and this is getting down to the, the end here, I did the final outlining of the rivet heads here on the inside of the canopy. This is all painted on the inside. Did a little bit of detailing in here so that while this is you can see it as you see through the glass you can kind of see inside of this and what would normally be the rivet heads inside the canopy now one of the things that I remember from years ago is I'd, I'd make a whole canopy and I'd get all done I'd paint these bars over or whatever and I'd look inside and see sanding sealer in there and I says oh yeah you know if you're making putting all this effort into a model you really like to see it uh, you know up close and have all the details that you possibly can I made up this little quadrant for the floor. Put a couple little, these are little decals on the dashboard. The seat really looks good, the texture. I'm happy I put a little decal up on the radio. And I'm pretty, uh, you know, pretty much ready to close this up now. I'm going to put the cockpit on and see if there's any spots that when this is on that don't look real exactly the way I want. And if the wall looks okay, I'll get ready and put the glass on. Again, I'm still looking just for any little spot that I'm just not crazy about. Look at it from a lot of different angles. Now, what I want to do is lay out in my mind, wherever this is going to be a flat uh, joint onto some wood, I'm going to put a series of little tiny pinholes. Up around here, I'm not, because up around here, the, the the glue is going to go in on an angle. But all around here, I want to put a thousand little pinholes, and that'll help hold the epoxy, hold that in place. I'm just taking a pin, and I'm all around the perimeter, putting a lot of little pinholes, so that the epoxy can make the equivalent of little rivet heads, or whatever you want to call it, little nails. Otherwise, you don't really get a good bond to this the uh, butyrate. You can see all the little pinholes that I've used. Now just the idea here so the, the epoxy gets a little bit better grip. Now I'm going to mix up some slow drying epoxy to one too bigger than the other epoxy. Get this taped in place and that'll probably be it for this session. I want to be real careful. I'll wipe off the inside of the canopy real good with a paper towel. And I want to be real careful not to get so much that it gets up under the canopy any more than necessary. Now I certainly want to make sure I get a good a good amount of this epoxy in there. I'm only going to put it on the wood. I'm not going to put it on the canopy. Because I don't want any to get up inside, if possible. Of course, that's really an impossible dream. Now, Ski Dombrowski had a good idea at one time, but I, I've never found out how he did it. He made black epoxy for putting on his canopy. And maybe he put ink or powder or dye or something in there, but it's a good idea. In fact, right now, I wish I knew how he did it. Then I wouldn't have to be so careful. Like up in the front here, I want to get right where that little groove is. I want to get plenty in there. Now, any of the epoxy that oozes out, I want to get as much oozed Away. This will just make a lot less sanding later on. 
And the last thing I'll do is I'll wipe this with a little bit of alcohol on a Q-tip, and then I'll start pinning the canopy on, taping it down, whatever I need to do to get it held in place. Now I'm just making sure when I put the first two pins in that I have real good alignment, looking from the front, from the side, making sure nothing dripped and drooled inside. Everything looks okay. Now I want to start the four corners in the back. Because this wood has been hardened up with CA, you have a real real good grip on it. And these pinholes allow the epoxy to sit right in there and make like little nails, rivets, whatever you want to call them. And of course I guess the most important one, the one right on the top. I check this from all the angles that I possibly can look in and everything looks pretty kosher. Now I'm going to put this aside to dry. This is actually going to be it for today. What I'm going to do now is when this dries, well next time I get a chance to work on this, pull all the pins out and I want to put thick CA into those holes. And what it'll be like a lot of little pin rivets holding that canopy on. Then when I sand that all flat, the thick CA will sand flat. But the next step will be, of course, let this dry. Don't don't let anything touch it, and uh, you know, don't hit it with a snow shovel or whatever. So, I'm going to call it quits for this session, and we'll come back to this when that's dry. Well, we just had a visitor to the shop. I won't mention any names, but he specifically said this looks like a Jose Modesto voodoo doll. Oh my God, he's right too. Voodoo, put a spell on me. Now I figured this would be easier to do on a storyboard. What I did when I installed this canopy, oh boy, can you believe this? Another bad pen. Now here it goes. Any of the areas where, let me just draw this out. Now I'm using that old Jose Modesto uh, analogy here. Anyway. What's going to happen now when I take all these pins out, if I show this on a cross section, here's the canopy, here's the wood. Great drawing, by the way. There'll be a hole right through. Okay, this is where the pin was at one time. Let's pretend that that's, what, that's what's really happening. Now what I'm going to do, when I take the pin out, I want to take some thick CA and fill this hole. Now two things I don't want to happen. I don't want to have it drool inside the canopy. So I'm just going to try to seal it, put a little bit of kicker around the area. Easiest way, just the slightest bit of kicker on a Q-tip. Now a couple of things I don't like to, and I, I can pass this on because it, it's not a good idea, is to spray this area with kicker. The kicker sometimes works its way down inside the canopy. Take a Q-tip, rub this area with kicker. Then take a little drop of CA on a Q-tip, rub it in, and as you're rubbing it in, what it'll make, it, it'll look like this black area, like a little nail hole. So in effect, what you'll have when it's all finished is a lot of little thumbtacks, if you will, or I don't know what the right word would be, rivets. Then we're going to sand this, of course, all off, so that the final result is going to be, let's hope the final result is going to be, that this is all nice and smooth and we'll even try to get the silk span to come right up to the edge so this will be a real nice joint here I hope and these will be under the surface then now I've installed an awful lot of canopies this way and had real good success I, I, I'm even looking for an easier way but as far as I know right now this is the only really bulletproof way of getting one to stay on and I have seen other people that where the canopy, let's just say, if this is the canopy, where it joins here, and it's not really 
attached real well, in time it'll crack here or you'll get a stress crack right here. Right in the corner is where it'll always tend to crack. On a typical nobler, that's where it'll always crack is right in the corner. Okay, the other thing, if we look from the top view, probably if you look at a cross-sectional view, this is what we have. This is the wood. And this would be, the canopy is now sticking up just a little bit above it. This is the plastic. And we have these, what, what's going to look like rivet heads going right through the whole thing. But what is going to be real, really, uh, I don't know the right word here either, precision, is I want to get some masking tape over the glass that's not going to get painted. Now some of that glass area is going to get painted, some isn't. This is going to be tape. Now what I'm going to try to do is, with the tape in place, is block sand this right down so that the final result is that I have a perfectly smooth transition right up to the tape. Let's say the tape is here. And I hope you can follow this because this is kind of a kind of an important thing to understand. Now, what you don't want to have in the final analysis here, and, and again, this is really getting to the fanatical point, but if you're really going to do something right, you may as well do it right. What you don't want to have when you peel off the last layer of tape is a bump. You know, you don't want to have the paint over here all built up. Let's just make the paint here so that you have an edge. Because what will happen is eventually when you buff it out, this will buff right through and you'll have a kind of a, a nasty looking thing there. So what I'm going to try to do is each time I put some paint on, let's say I put a layer of paint on here, and you can follow this through. It's really, once you get the theory, the rest is easy. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to move the tape back. Then I'm going to move the tape back. Move the tape back. So that when I put the clear over this, I don't have a big ridge here. I don't want to have a big ridge. That's what I'm trying to avoid is that ridge. Then I'm going to, when it's, when it's of course finished, I want to fill this whole thing with clear so that I can buff it out. The ultimate thing would be that I can rub my hand right over and never feel the transition between the canopy, the paint, the same way you can't feel the transition between the lettering or any of that stuff. If you figure out or if you have a clear idea in your mind of how this can be done or should be done, the rest is really easy. You'll never, you'll never have a problem with a canopy. These will just go by bulletproof and you won't have any problem at all. Now the ultimate result we're looking for is when we're all finished with this canopy, that I can take my hand and rub it right over the whole surface wipe the plane off any direction, any dimension, and never feel any joints. I want that whole area to be perfectly smooth. i just pass a little story on to you. When Harold Price made the Bolt and Paul Defiant, it had a canopy that looked something like this. It had a gun turret in the back, if I remember. It had ribs. And what I was thinking of doing, and it would have been easy to do when we made the mold, is put these lines on in raised tape so that they actually would be bumps. And the only problem with having outward bumps on is every time you'd wipe the plane off, you'd be pulling the paint right off of these high spots. In fact, I remember Harold, about 20 flights into flying that Defiant, the paint started coming off all the corners, and he was very frustrated. He had to go back and sand this all out, mask it all off, and repaint it. And, and what he wound up doing is putting about 20 coats of extra clear on a canopy. I didn't want to do that. I really want to, I mean, we have an extra ounce of weight in the canopy. We have extra weight here and everywhere. I don't want to have to put on 50 coats of clear over the canopy to get rid of these little high spots. So what I'm trying to do is make this, this is a combination stunt ship. It's not a scale model. And I really want to make it as practical as possible. So one of the sacrifices that we've made is that we want to have that canopy just as if it was carved in. It was a totally smooth transition. And that's relatively easy to do if you have the theory of laying out the paint and get moving the tape up. Each time you move that tape up, you'll get rid of that heavy edge. One final thought here. What I like to do, and this will help every modeler, whether you're building RC planes or boats or anything, at some point in time, and it's usually right about now, 
you have to come up with a schedule. Now, we're way behind the eight ball because of all this snow, the roof on the two-family house caving in, all the problems that have put me behind. I'm actually right now probably about a month behind schedule. So what I like to do, is, and I will do this sometime later today off camera, and I'll, I'll try to show how, what I arrived at, is I try to make myself a schedule of things that still have to be done. Now, number one on that list is the canopy. Now the reason the canopy is the next thing is because I need the canopy in place before I can go on to the next step. The next step would be the fillets. I need the fillets in place before I can actually go on to tissue in the body. Now, if you see what I'm talking about, I need the tissue on the body before I can go on to the finishing of the body. Now I'm only making this up, Now, just an example, the trim. I always paint the trim on a plane first. I need the body finished before I can make the trim. Okay, but within each area here, there's certain things I can do to get ahead on. In other words, out here in whatever you want to call this, I have the rudder, bottom scoop. I can put these and bring these up to silver. So what will happen is I'll get a certain amount of work done on the canopy. And let's say I only have uh, a half hour left in the session. I know I don't want to start the fillets. I don't want to be in the middle of doing something and end the session. So what I can do, I can transition over here, work on a rudder, work on the bottom scoop, get that into silver. I can prime the cowl. Now the cowl, because it's fiberglass, all that's going to need is auto primer, a couple coats of auto primer and paint and then silver. The idea being, if you make yourself up a schedule, you can always follow the logical sequence that you want to do things in. You would not want to come to the shop, have an hour to work, look at the schedule and, and start doing something down here. You want to follow the logical sequence of events. And I, <clears throat> I guess I've said this over and over on the video, one of the things I think most people can pick up off the video is the schedule, the sequencing of how things go. In other words, we have right here an elevator in silver. If I was right now to have the elevator in raw wood, well, when I get down to this part, of paint and I have to start this whole silver and I have to silver the wing and the tail and the, uh, oh my god you, you, this is very frustrating I don't think this would be a good thing at all so to get as much of the plane in silver ahead of time so that when you wind up at the end you need to finish the canopy the fillets the body the trim and then I can start painting on I guess I'll start with invasion stripes round L's uh, whatever kind of trim is going to be on the body and again, I wish I could tell you I settled on a paint job, but I haven't. I'm glad Joe has. Joe has, at least he's ahead of me on that. But anyway, if, if you make yourself up a little schedule, boy, are you going to be ahead of the guy that just comes down to the shop and says, oh, well, today, what will I do? Uh, I think I'll sand the body. But he doesn't have the canopy on. Well, I, I put the fillets in, but he doesn't. Yeah, yeah, you, you're, in, you're lost. Sit down. Even if you spend a half an hour or so, make yourself up a logical sequence with side jobs that can, that small side jobs. Now, for instance, today, it's very warm outside, so if I get a chance, I can prime the cowling. That can be drying. Another thing here, anytime you can get paint, I ought to, I ought to put this on the tape. I've always thought about this. I never have a tape. Anytime you can paint something, let's just do this. I don't know if this is logical or not. Let's say this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If you can paint something on Monday and let it dry till Friday before you sand it, you're way ahead of the game than if you wait till Thursday, paint it, and sand it. All this drying time makes the sanding so much easier. So it's always, and this is why I try to paint the silver early on in the program. Get as much of a plane so that in the end, the only soft spots on the plane are going to be around the fuselage. Everything else has been drying for a month or two. The earlier on you can paint, the longer paint can dry, the easier it will be to sand. You'll save yourself a mountain of work by planning this out ahead of time. Now just one, one final look before I take those pins out. I'm looking at the canopies here and then looking at the canopy from all different angles and I'm relatively satisfied that I've got the look, the look I want. The headrest looks right in the side view. I tried to simulate this, whatever this really is. I never really have figured it out. And it's different in all the Spitfires anyway, so I guess it really isn't critical. Some of them have 
uh, whatever, and some of them have nothing. So I really have gotten to the point where I'm looking at this, that uh, relatively, relatively satisfied how this canopy came out. Now with the T-pins, what's a good idea is rather than just yank them out, twist them first. Give them a little twist, they'll come out a lot easier, and a lot of times they'll take less of a chunk of wood out. The dressmaker pins, I put a 90 degree bend in them. Twist the T-pins. Always a good idea too to have some of the thick, heavy pins. I call them dressmaker pins, these are little tiny pins. And Obviously, there's jobs and places you can use both kinds. Whenever one is sticky, rather than pulling it straight out, put a 90 degree bend in it, twist it, and kind of unthread it if you can. first thing I want to do is I want to look inside and make sure I don't have any kind of dripping or drooling or anything that I'm really not going to be satisfied with. Depending on how severe it is, I don't know if I could even change it at this point in time anyway. Boy, I would love to in the future make a canopy that went Whiteley had a canopy like that in, uh, let's see, it was in 1980. What did I like that? That was cool. All right, I'm going to fill in all these little holes, as I said before. I'm going to fill in all these little holes with thick C8. There's some little high points of wood here. And then get this masked off. Well, I'm just going by each pinhole and just injecting in maybe one drop of CA. Take a clean Q-tips, kind of force it down in there. Help to start creating a little tiny fillet we want there. And the last thing, I want to take some C some kicker. This is kicker on a Q-tip, because I don't want the kicker going all over the canopy. And just wipe that one area. And of course, I'll go right around the whole canopy the same way. Now the next step is I'm going to mask this off very carefully and be try to get really right on the line because as I move the tape in and in and in I don't want these lines to get really too thick so even the first coat I can leave just a little bit of the green exposed because I'm going to keep moving that tape back several times in the time that it takes by the time I build up the finish ready for the clear and then when it's ready for the clear I'm going to try to bury this in clear so I can really get that that really beautiful smooth transition that feel and I'm sure when you take the, the plane to appearance judge <clears throat> judging, you can see, I've seen it many times, go look at the video, here's the judge, mmm, rub the lettering, mmm, mmm, and right away the guy gets aroused, and boom, you're in the front row. Focal point of the airplane. Now, the best idea here is, if you're going to do these tape lines, get a brand new, either a lovin' blade or a scalpel. And by the way, this thing that Joe gave, uh, this tape dispenser is really handy, just for this reason. But what I don't want to do when I do cut the tape, I don't want to cut it and cut right down into the canopy. I want to get a nice, clean, transitional cut. Again, I can just leave, I can cover up just a tiny bit of that green. And the trick is just to score the tape. And don't cut into the canopy. Whoop, not hard enough. I want to be real careful here because I'm going to be sanding around this tape. And I don't want this tape to give me that ratty looking edge. I want that real nice edge.
next. Now the purpose of the yellow tape was just to establish parallel lines. And the last thing I want to do, and I put the blue tape around the edge because it bends real nice. The last thing I'll do is pull off the yellow tape, make sure everything is in place, and I'll be ready to start sanding this canopy out. It's, oh man, this phone, I'm telling you. President Nixon is definitely not dead. It's unbelievable. President? Now the idea here is to build up a little radius, the same as the fillet. But I don't want to have a big giant radius that the paint's going to bubble from. So same as the fillet, I want to keep a nice neat line, but I certainly don't want to build up a big giant, something like an epoxolite radius fillet here. Again, the tape protects the canopy, and I can sand up onto the canopy just enough. But I can get some scratches in there, and I'll get some adhesion, get some mechanical adhesion. Take one little area at a time. Let's see, I leave the dust right in the low spots. Yeah, I'm just going to press that dust right down in there. Hit this with some thin CA and a Q-tips, and let that fillet and hardness build up very gradually within three or four times of doing it. Again, if you do this in a lot of small steps, you won't have a problem. When you build up that big fat radius, that's when paint doesn't stick. Nice, neat, small radius fillets. Let it kick normally with the Q-tips, and I'll go over this four or five times until I build up that nice little radius in there. And give this another coat. I'd say the way this looks, three or four coats would have just build me up the base of the radius here. I want pretty much the same radius all around here as I have in here, and that's the minimum. And notice, I'm trying to do one one edge at a time. I'll do this edge, and then this will be the last thing because I need to get a reverse curve in there. I'll need to make up a little sanding block or use one of those tubes. I'm going right up to the tape, scratching the plexiglass, but not out onto the tape. As close to the tape as I can without going out onto it. sand this side in. Let's get this on the macro lens. And you can see how the tape protects it from little sanding guys. Like these little these little low spots, a little low spot here, I'm just filling in with thick CA and then block sanding it right back out so that there'll be as little filler here as possible. It'll be mostly thick CA, thin CA, and the wood around here, you can see I've hardened it all up so that I can grind into it. And I'll probably harden up maybe an inch or two back of this so that I can grind into it. Now after about, no, maybe four or five sandings and recoatings, this is a perfect blend. You can't feel where the canopy ends, the wood begins, the CA is all down in here right up to the fillet. So this is nice and hard. Good, you can get a good sand on it. I got sanding up on right up into the canopy and I'm going to work on the other side next and it looks like what the most work is going to be here again this is a relatively easy joint this here is, is about a medium but I want to get this area right in here and I want to get a, a real nice smooth transition in there I may need some filler on this I don't know yet I 
Now this one area here is where a dowel comes in real handy. This is a piece of copper tubing. Getting that transitional curve from the canopy into the fuse side. I've been real slow and careful. Sanding it, putting a coat of thick CA on, letting it cook, and then get another coat on so that I build up a nice fillet. In fact, in this case, what I'm going to do I'm going to try to build this up in a couple layers here. Well, we're running out of glue. I love it. And the best tool I've found for doing this is my pinky. Or my second finger, in which case <laughs> the first finger is all full of glue already. You just bring it right up. Now, a good tip here. When you get glue like this on your fingers, or you're using your fingers for a spatula, don't use kicker. If that kicker goes off, it's, a, it's not a funny story. What happened to Peggy Ortiz had a, a toenail that was broken. I want to get some on the side here. And Joe fixed it with CA and then hit, and hit it with kicker. He almost set her foot on fire. It wasn't a funny thing. It just hardens up that wood along the side, too. You just let that kick, and then I can work on it some more. The other side actually took about five or six coats of CA to get that fillet just the way I wanted it, so I'm not going to be impatient here. I'm just going to take my time, get the blend as, as close as I can. As I'm sanding, I'm twisting the dowel, so I'm picking up a new piece of sandpaper as I go along. i got to work this area up in here. The nose on this isn't sanded out yet, and it's been sitting, I guess, a week or so. So what's going to be a big help is when I go to sand out the nose, that epoxy is good and rock hard. It should sand out like butter. In fact, I'm cutting the edge of it right now. It's just dusting right off. quite a few coats of CA to seal this up because this really didn't transition in perfectly. It was off a little bit. But I've just been grinding away at it back and forth, adding some CA and using a sanding block for good use here. One or two more coats and we'll have it. See, and it's this transition here. I'm trying to get a perfect smooth transition in here. Needs a couple extra coats of CA and then just constantly block sanding it down. Now I've got the CA out maybe an inch all around here. So this whole area, I can just run my hand over it, find any rough spot, any spot that I'm not real happy with. I've got the band sanded a little bit so the first coat of dope or filler or whatever will stick to it. It's just going to need a little more work back here and I think I'll have it. thoughts here as I wrap this up. You certainly want to leave these scratches in. You want to have the final sanding have plenty of scratches, either 220 or even rougher, especially in the C8. That gives the dope or the filler or whatever is going to go on here first a good bond. So I'm going up all around the bridges, getting a little scratched area on everything. Use your hand to find any hard spots. Rough spot is one right here. 
the next thing I'm going to work on, maybe I'll have a little time today, I don't know. Time. I want to try to sand a little bit of the nose out, and then I can transition the nose right into here. Remember that thing of how you want to start in the front, work your way around, and come back? You don't want to just do hodgepodge things like a checkerboard here anyway. Anyway, I tell you, I put quite a bit of time in this. Actually, this took longer than I thought it would, the better part of one of my sessions. But I really would like to get this. The, the canopy is going to be the focal point, one of the focal points of the plane. And I sure don't want to have it that everything inside, all that detail, and you come out here and there's a big rough glue seam or something. Now, I've got this pretty well transitioned. I'm trying not to use filler. What I'll do, I'll bring the tissue right up to the tape. Well, I tissued it right up to the very end of the tape with the tissue. Now, whatever time I have left in this session, I don't know, getting later than I thought it was, I want to start working from the canopy forward on this glass. I think I can get some of this nose sanded out. I'm using 220 paper and a block. Hey, this is it's dusting right off. It always pays to let glass dry if you can. Boy, it makes it so much easier to do. And of course the trick is to sand it smooth but not go down through the glass and have the fibers all come jumping up at you. At least on the first sand out anyway. And I want to blend in those areas where I have double glass. I see up around here I have that pointed tool, that sanding tool. That really comes in handy then. Right in the fillet area. I want to be careful not to go through up at the nose ring where I have this double glass. I want to keep that up there. Boy, that's powder and off. It's powder. It's like sand and filler. I can blend this right in from this sand out right up to the area that I've sanded out around the canopy. Blending that in is kind of easy because this, this glass has dried so long. Boy, it really makes it makes it so nice to sand it out. I can't tell you how nice this glass is sanded. I'll be done in a half an hour here. It's unbelievable. But that really is one of the big secrets. Always let that epoxy dry. A couple extra days, even one extra day, really makes... And this is just powder. Like sanding filler. And this glass is sanding out so nicely that I'll definitely be able to get this sanded out tonight. And one of the things I'm planning, now remember that scheduling thing I said, is I'll be able to make the fillets up tomorrow. I'm trying to plot this out in my mind and maybe even get a coat of clear on the body. I mean, we're already, we're less than a week away from having this guy ready for the paint job. So you can tell I'm getting a little enthusiastic about it. It's, when you see the glass come off like powder like this, boy, it is a joy to sand. You get a beautiful velvety finish in a matter of minutes. It's unbelievable. The whole secret is let it dry. Give it a couple days to dry. Schedule it in that way. Even the edges here have dried up beautifully. And make sure I get all these edges radius. Powder. Now one thing I thought I'd mention, and to me it's significant, is I don't like breathing in any of this, any of this stuff that I don't have to. So the idea is to get all the glass if I can sanded today. Then I'll take all these blankets and sheets, everything, get them into the laundry, and take all these clothes. You can see it even gets on your clothes. Get all this stuff into the laundry tonight, 
So when I start tomorrow, the glass being all sanded, I don't have any of this fiberglass dust laying around the shop. I hate breathing this stuff in. I don't mind the dope and I don't mind the sawdust, but the glass dust is just rough to get it. And it gets everywhere. stuff is just powdering right off. I don't know if you can see it. It's powdering off. Now I got some really neat photos here from Australia in today's mail from Noel Corny. Now he was at the event for a while. <clears throat> I, I was corresponding with him about 10 years ago. Now that he's back in the event, this is the first ship he's built since he's back in the event, and he says it really flies well. Here's the finished model, and this really looks nice. Real nice paint job, by the way. Midgley, check the paint job out. Kind of a pattern master stiletto kind of look. I-beam wing. Real nice. By the way, Noel has... Uh, in his note has said he's been helping other people in his club and uh, for which obviously I give him a lot of credit. Now in this letter that he sent, he said it took him over three years to make these four models and uh, <clears throat> being he was out of, the, out of the event for a while, uh, he missed stunt and got back into it and he had to just go on a building spree. No, four models in three years. Cool. And they all look nicely finished. Midgley, eat your heart out. And here's one of his, here's one of his, uh, this is the kind of pictures I like to see, one of his pupils awarding him a trophy at uh, one of their local contests. Noel, thanks a lot, and I'll pass these on. Definitely pass them on to Stump News, and we'll get back to sanding FUs out. Now, there's sand sanding on a nose really went... You can see how it just got it off. It really went a lot faster than I thought it would. In fact, I have a little bit of extra time, and I want to work on what... Here's what really happens, is when you put the fillets on, and you put... We haven't done the fillets yet, but you do all this little work with the block. You get little dots of CA, and I'm going to try to get this on a macro lens. Here's one here, here's one here. You can feel them. No matter how careful I am, I always get these little splatterings. So what I do is when I'm going to get the fillet area ready now, I'm going to get the sanding block and some 320 and just get this area maybe an inch away from the fillet ready. And there's some little dots. Here's one right here. Some little dots on there I have to clean off. And then I'll be ready tomorrow. Actually, the goal is tomorrow to be doing fillets if possible. So I'm going to work on that right now. And the best thing here is that gray sandpaper. It's 320. And I try to tear it in such a way that I don't have a lot hanging over the corners. In fact, I'll try to show this. Even though this isn't really super necessary, I try to get it so I don't have the corners up here because I want to get right up into the fillet area. And the 320 will usually knock those little dots right off without making a big giant problem for you. And of course, we'll respray some of this silver, maybe all of it, who knows. And I have a couple little spots I touched up here. So this is a good time that I can just get that corner of the sanding block worked right into the fillet area. Even though I don't have the fillets, I can do all the preparation work for it right now. And I can get just enough of this silver scuffed up that when I get the dope over the fillet, it'll go back and I, I won't have a, a definite edge. I'll have a very erratic edge and I can sand it right in. I just want to show this on the tape. This is something that's pretty significant. You'll see the corners start to get rounded off on a tool. Remember that old trick of just sawing or grinding this off? Now the idea of leaving the sandpaper on this sanding block is it holds the sandpaper as you move. So this is really a good filler tool. I really am having a lot of success with this one. As crude as this is, you don't really need a lot of million dollar tools to build model planes. You need simple tools, but keeping a nice edge on it is important. So I'm going to go over to the wheel, sharpen a nice corner on this, and then just cut it back maybe a sixteenth of an inch at a time. And I'll get, I'll get many more uh, carvings out of this one tool. 
Now again, after I dress this off, the last thing I want to do is just put a slight radius around this whole thing. Otherwise, what's going to happen is I'm going to be gouging with these corners. And I don't want the sandpaper sticking up over here. I'd like the sandpaper to, in fact, another good trick is cut the sandpaper the same width as this so you don't have any hanging over. You don't want to have that big piece up here scratching as you go around the fillet. There's a real nice fillet tool. So now if you just clip the sandpaper on both edges like this, what this allows you to do is you don't have any, when you're sanding in a, I'm trying to make it a 90 degree angle, you don't have that flap of sandpaper chewing up the other side. And the sandpaper that's already on this block holds this right in position real nice. So that's about the right angle right there too for doing these fillets. Now you can see right up around here, this is not the only spot needless to say, there's about five or six little dings on here that God knows how they got here, but this green stuff, the green 3M, put a nice little thin coat of that on. Five minutes and we'll sand it out. I've got another beauty out here. I don't know if you can see this on the macro lens or not. There's one right here. Some clumsy, probably me. But if you do it on an ongoing basis, you never get to the end of the plane and then have three days of filling dings. And here's one that's all sanded out. That's perfectly smooth. You'll never feel that. These are those little damn dots. A couple of those dots. There's one back there. Now these are microscopic. This one has to be sanded out. These are microscopic little things, but they will add up. The more of this you can get done, so just before we put the real paint on, this is perfectly smooth. It has that look like it's carved out of a single block of aluminum. That's what I'm looking for. And if you wait till after the paint is on, forget it. You're, you're covering mountains and valleys and hills and who the hell knows what. I like to do it this way and by doing a little bit each day or keeping after it, I never get to the end of the plane and have a monster on my hands. Now, <clears throat> we're at the point in this plane where the next logical step, remember that's scheduling. Fillets. Now, what I really wish, what I really wish, and obviously this is not going to happen, I wish I had this magic answer and I could tell you every plane I've ever built, the fillets come out perfect. You know what? can't do it. It'd be a lie. You know what? It'd be a lie just a bet for anybody that I've ever known. It seems like the more planes you, you've built, the more times you've run into different problems. What I can say is, over the years, this is what my experience has been, and I'll just make this brief and sweet. The olden days, this will be the wing and a fuse. The olden days, we used to take a poxolite or body putty, one or the other bond on, make this big giant round fillet. Boy, my original sweeper must have had four pounds of epoxolite on it. And I thought, oh boy, strong, strong, strong. This is nonsense. This big giant fillet, what it does, it gives the dope from both directions. Look at the leverage you have to pull this up. The further back you go, the bigger this radius is, a big radius, the dope has a lot of leverage. When it shrinks, it pulls up and you get bubbles. And I don't think anybody out there has ever built a plane that <laughs> hasn't even had some anxiety about fillet bubbles. Now I know these are the things over the years that have worked well. On the Sidewinder, and I'll just try to go back, Sidewinder, Griffin, uh, just to name two, had a uh, tsunami. Carved wood fillets seemed to work real nice. The only problem I had, and this is with tsunami, is I never got a nice joint right here. I always had to put a little bit of that dap in there and what I had was the fillet stayed nice and I got a bubble over the dap. So what I've done now is I don't use any dap in fillets at all. Absolutely no dap in my fillets anyway. No dap. If you can eliminate the dap it seems like that's one of the one of the problem areas. So what I've tried to do and I'll like I said, I'm not going to make a big deal out of this. this. This has been my conclusion. The airplanes that have had fillets that have lasted a long time have had small radiuses, and these are the things that seem significant here. Small radius, 
what I do, I try to make it out of, out of fixed CA and leave it scratched. Now, the rougher the scratches, of course, within reason, the better. Because as that, if we exaggerate that little fillet and it has all these little rough edges, well, you can see this would be exaggerated. The paint's going to get a nice little tooth. And that's what I'm looking for. Again, I wish I had, boy, oh boy, if I could only write this or, or, or put it on video and say, do this and you'll never have fillet problems. Anybody that says that, I don't know if I could believe them. What it is is the fillets are a constant problem, just as any reverse radius is. The reason is, any if you understand what's happening, you have a fighting chance. Anywhere you have a curve in the plane where there's dope here and it wants to shrink, and it can pull, it works its way up here, it works its way up here. It has leverage, it can pull. A lot of times you take a plane out in the sun that looks perfect. Tsunami looked perfect down in the cellar, put it out in the sun, <laughs> look like popcorn under the fillets, but it only happened under the dap. Now, you may do all this, you may even use DAP and not have problems, but I know this way you minimize the chance that you're going to have a problem. If you have a little tiny radius, there's a very small chance that that will pick up. Very little chance, and I'm going to try to maintain a nice small radius. You know what I do with that tool, with the sanding tool, so I can get in the corners and keep just a little lip of sandpaper on there? I want to keep that as small as possible. It also adds something that I like about the plane is it looks workmanlike. You know, anybody that's ever done, <laughs> if you've ever renovated an old house, you know what bullshit they did years ago. They made the ceiling all crooked and then they brought the wall up to it and then they put on this big fat molding about a foot wide so it looked good. Well, the fillets are kind of like the molding. They kind of, they're to cover up mistakes. Now modern houses have nice neat sheetrock corners. And what I'm, what I'm trying to do, and I guess part of this is, uh, is, is emulate, simulate, whatever, get rid of the molding and have those nice neat little fillets. And whenever I've done sheetrock work, getting those fillets and corners perfect is a real chore, but it's always worth it. And I think it really adds a little bit of a business look to the plane when you can look at a corner and you see it's a perfectly matched corner. It's not a bullshit thing and there's a big wide piece of molding down it. So those are just my thoughts. Tomorrow we're going to do fillets. Let's hope anyway. <laughs> now one, one final thing before I quit for the day, and I won't know how this works until I'm completely finished with the model. I had a glob of, of all things of epoxy or CA right here on the tissue. Now I sanded it roughly before and I really was getting skeptical about, mm, I'm getting this too thin. I took a little bit of that green putty and I'm going to try to wet sand this out when I do the wet sanding with some 600 or 1200. I'll let it dry overnight. But I'm going to see if it's practical to do little repairs like that over silk span with that green putty. Now, again, I, well, I can't do it without the macro lens. You see, I've gotten the tissue about as thin as I can get it. But anyway, if you look at some of these areas, this is what it looks like before I go on to the next step. I try to get all these joints as clean and neat as possible. I, and I remember in the old days, boy, I could remember like it was yesterday. Get out a top flight 10.6 and put in about three to three and a half ounces of epoxalite. Make sure it goes out onto the wing here and up here. And this big globby, awful thing. And as soon as you put paint on it, and, and then you, what was even funny, I, I don't want to skip this, but what would even funny, you'd go to the gnats and everybody would have bubbled fillets, everybody. And everybody would say, ah, oh, you put nitrate dope on it first, then you put this, then you steal, steal wool and sandpaper, dynamite it, put toothpicks in it. Everybody had some completely bizarre kind of way of dealing with it. But s as soon as I've gotten rid of the radius and get that neat, like a modern house corner in there, um, <laughs> at least I sleep a little at night knowing these fillets are not going to jump up the first time I take it out in the sun. Famous last words, I know. I Uh, at the end of any day that I sand fiberglass or work with a lot of sandpaper, 
I always try to vacuum up and clean up. Get ready for the next day. Get rid of all these clothes and I vacuumed up all the blankets and everything. Now this is the kind of night it's been. I open up the uh, UPS and my new friend, and I say new friend because the guy has about a hundred <laughs> videotapes already, but uh, obviously uh, the relationship has just begun. He sent in this book. This looks like it's either similar to or the same as the book Joe Adamusco has, but boy, it's got exactly what I want to see as far as now uh, paint jobs. I'm still undeeply. I don't even want to say this anymore. I'm still undecided. But look how nice shows the camo lines, all the things. And this is this is a a very big book. All kinds of detail. Engine details, Merlin engine, all the props, and of course the Spitfire. Anyway, this was sent in by Ed Gallagher. He calls himself Ed the House Painter, but he's he's now Ed the Spitfire friend. Look at all this stuff. Okay, this is unbelievable. This is really oh, the cockpit too. Anyway, more for me to look at. I'm sure in the next couple of days this will add to my. By the way, I'm looking at. Basically, I'm at the point here where I have to really make. In fact, I think tomorrow or the next day. George and I are going to go down to the paint supplier and see if we can get them to mix us up some paint. This book arrived just in time, Ed. Ed Gallagher of Florida. Just in time, and I will I will definitely be using it. Bet your life on it. Go watch some tapes, Ed. I'll tell you, the first thing I want to do, I want to make up the little fillet blocks. Now, one of the things that's real nice is, because we made these flaps oversized and we cut this piece in a parallel to the fuselage mode, it should be real easy to lay out the block. What I always do, and this is the biggest mistake you can always make since the flaps are quarter inch, you would normally think you take a piece of quarter inch and get in there, but what happens if you do, you work up here and then there's a bump going up to the airfoil. So what I'm going to do, this is really a 3 8 piece, probably a half inch piece, I don't know. It's a very oversized piece. I want to make <coughs> the fillet very oversized up here and then sand it right into position. Of course I want to keep it even with the, we have the center line on there. And I know pretty much what this position is going to be. I'm going to lay the block up under here and trace right down and then just start carving away on this. I, the idea is I don't want to have a big taper back here either. I want to have this fillet as reasonably small as possible for the simple reason that I want that fillet, that edge, to continue right down in what, one nice smooth transition. Now I want to get the block right up on the fuse. Always leave a little bit extra because you're going to have to notch out for the horn. I get a knife cut right up on here. Leave a little bit, a little bit oversize. Okay, I put a little notch up at one end. Now I want to slide this right into position and trace out what the flap edge will be. Now what, <coughs> what I did, I put a pin in one side so it would hold it, and I want to get an accurate mark where the wing actually ends here, and an accurate line around the back of the flap. And now I want to get an accurate line on the bottom here too. And now I can just connect the two dots and I'll have the outline of the fillet. Now I have the center line that I lined up with the center line on the fuse. Let this sit in a horn. Trace this out in the back. And I went a little bit about the thickness of a pen line bigger than I have to be here. Always a good idea to make this just a little bit bigger and then sand the final shape. And then it's just a question now of connecting the dots. It's hard doing this looking through the macro lens.
But it's gives you a good reference line where to start your carving from. I just went by, saw these two pieces off. Now, what I need to do is, I notice I've left a little bit extra here, is get a blend in here with the dowel, the, the old uh, dowel and the uh, some sandpaper glue to it and try to get this radius in here. And at the same time, I want to keep the center line on there. I want the center line to line up if possible. And I can just put the final little bit of an angle in here until it meets the, the flap exactly how I want. Always a good idea here, just leave everything just a little bit oversized and do the final little bit with a sanding block. Now this curve in here, I just rough it out with a little bit of a uh, number 11 blade here. And this is that old piece of aluminum tubing with a piece of sticky back sandpaper on it. I just want to get little by little get the paper in here that I need. Go take a little fit on the plane. Just put a slightest little bit of a taper. You can even get this little back piece done off the fuselage. It's all much easier off the fuselage. And of course, the last little thing I want to do is hollow these out. Every little bit helps. last little bit of extra wood out of here. This is really a part that doesn't add any strength. It's going along for the ride, so probably can get it down to where it's like a sixteenth wall thickness. Now a good idea is to always double check all the positioning here. I've got a folded up piece of sandpaper holding this on the center line, the flap in neutral, push this as tight up against the wing, check top and bottom that it's equal, or a little bit on the plus side, because we're going to want to sand that final curve in there. Once it's there, tack it in position, before you get a final glue joint on there. Once you know you have this seam real even, you wouldn't want that seam or you don't want any clearance fits, I'll run a bead of glue right up around, off in there, and then I can get a final little sanding right in here, and I'll be ready to work that side of the fillet. Then I'll come back, I'll do the other side off camera, I'll get these even, and then I'll start working on that little fillet area. I got that other fillet done off camera. Now what I want to do, I want to start on one side. Notice that I'm doing the bottom first. I want to take my sanding tool, get a little bit of an edge in there, and then take the thick CA, run a bead, wipe it with my finger, and just let it dry maybe five minutes, and then just touch it with kicker. Let the kicker spray down from 100 feet away. Just the slightest bit of kicker to ensure that it kicks off. Just a couple of thoughts. This is where it really pays to be able to take the flaps off the plane and get in here, get in all these edges. Where the fillet and the wing transition, that's usually the most difficult spot. And I'm going to try to build that up with several layers of thick CA. But working this groove out, now now, you want to be real careful you don't start sawing the wing down and carving a groove in the wing. That's why it's real important to have this sanding block with an angle on it. I just want to sand in there real, real carefully, get it as smooth as possible, get the end where it blends out into the fuselage. I 
And it's this transition here that's always the most difficult. Because what happens, you're going from a, a taper down to a straight line and you're trying to get it in a very small amount of, of uh, dimension. Getting that to be a perfect transition is really a difficult thing. Now before I do anything, I want to fill that up. You're right there, it's real. You're coming down on an angle and all of a sudden it's going off in this direction. So what I'm going to do is just put several layers of thick CA in there, let them kick, and then sand each one before I lay the first layer of filleting in. And the one thing here to avoid too is you really don't want to get into the uh, the way you hit it. You hit this with a lot of kicker and it turns into popcorn. So the best thing I know of is just let each side, let it just kick off normally. Rain kicker, in fact I'll show this once on the tape. When I say rain kicker down, this is what I mean. If we give it a minute or so to kick it in, that's it. Otherwise you're going to go for the popcorn ride. Now usually this takes several coats, several layers, whatever you want to call it. But I just think if if you take the cheap road out and throw some dap in there, when you put it out in the sun, you run the risk that it's going to be a, either a bubble or a crack. I know if you do it this way with the with the thick CA, you run a low risk that the fillets are going to either bubble or come up or whatever. This is really like the pay me now or pay me later system. It's a good idea when you do this, when you get to this part of the job, what I do, I keep a little rag soaked with acetone. As soon as you get this on your finger, get it right off. Trying to get this transition just, come on, running out of glue here too. The best, the best glue, if you can find it, I don't even know if they make it anymore, is that Satellite City Fix CA. Always seem to work the, work the best. But the SIG is working, so I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. And that's all the kicker. I'll just let it kick off. Now each time you do it, of course, you, your finger gets a layer of thick CA. So what I do, I roll up this little towel with acetone and just wipe it right off before it kicks off. I guess I've said it before, but if you if you were to have this on your finger and somehow get some kicker on it, boy, you'll, you won't need coffee to wake up that morning. It's taken about three or four coats of this thick CA to build up a nice smooth ridge in there. And probably a couple extra ones in here to get the transition smooth. Now what I've been doing with the sanding tool, you can see how I have the edges clipped. Then I use this edge of the sandpaper, then I'll use this edge, this edge. I'll turn it around, put a V in there. I'll get six shots with this with the sanding tool this way. Otherwise, you're going to wind up using a thousand sheets of sandpaper to do this job. But with this tool, you really can get in there and get a nice edge. And you go from both dimensions, top to bottom, and the wing out. And just leave it a scratch surface until you get some dope on it. The scratches will hold the dope. That's what most of all you want to have is good adhesion. Right in there. That's always the most difficult spot. Right in there to get. Another area that's difficult to get is that transition around the end. What I like, the best choice I know of is the old, the same tube that we use to cut that radius. And you can't keep it and do this, or you'll carve a notch in it. You've got to kind of, each time you run a pass, be moving it. And then try to get it right from the top, so you have the two radiuses kind of equal. 
And once you get this exactly the way you want it, hit it with thin CA or thick CA and harden it up. This way it won't, it won't take a beating every time you touch it with the sandpaper. And once you get that, uh, that rough carved shape, what the CA does, it, it doesn't let you lose it. Every time you, you go by with a piece of sandpaper, all of a sudden you're losing the edge. And of course, go out onto the fuselage side, maybe a three quarters of a half an inch, so that as you're transitioning here, you don't wind up soft, hard, soft, hard. The last thing you can just blend that area where you have the thick CA in, right into the fuse side. Now that about finishes one fillet, at least up to this point, and I'll do the other three off camera, just to save some time and tape here, but if I come across any quick tricks, <laughs> any quick tips, yeah, and you, you do invent things as you go along, so. Of course, you want to get this area nice and flat and a little bit of a radius across there. And as soon as I get the other side, then I'll even harden this up with fixed CA so that doesn't take little dents. Yeah, that didn't come out too bad. Reasonable. Now, I have to have a way of propping this up. I'm going to try to get the first coat of clear on here. Needless to say, you want to make the first coat as thin as possible. This looks like uh, it's just about right. You want it watery and drippy and drooly. You don't want to have it thick. You want to get good penetration into the wood. So what I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to get one coat of clear on here. Maybe wait uh, a couple of hours. I have some other stuff. In fact, I'll work on a mail. And I'll get. To, I'll actually get try to get two or three coats on today. Maybe three or four hours apart. Again, the first coat you want to get on good soaking, sopping wet. You want that good penetration. Might even get back here, the hatch. The oil gas. Sounds real nice. Yeah. For the views I was seeing, decided it was going to be. I'm not trying to build on what it's just. They don't have to weigh one. That's what the hell good is it? Hmm. Gee, they've stopped that since. And the deal with all of us are going to get. Alright, to everybody judging the Nats, this cast is now worth the 38 points. <laughs> Look at this foot, Bigfoot over here. Smile, Jim. Say hello, Bigfoot. That's about as good as it gets, but. Well, let me tell you, while the dope is drying, we're all going to George's, and we're going to go have lunch and buy the paint for this thing. If they sell it to us, we'll see. No, all this dope was dry, and Jimmy, me, and George went out and took our Spitfire color chip chart down to chart, and I got some real interesting thing, real interesting information to share with you. I got the pigment for four of the colors. There's no paint in here. This is just pigment. But in talking to the uh, the DuPont rep, I guess is what he is. I want to show this on the video. Oh, here we are. He ran me out a little computer printout for each color. Let me get this on a lens. And now this is something even I wasn't aware of. It shows what's in here, what different colors, the amounts. And it also shows the total amount. Now i got to find one. He's got to look at all these drugs. It shows how much of the stuff goes in each... Oh, here's the big one. How much goes in each... There's the yellow, the green, blah, 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 if you wanted to mix this up yourself. But how much, how much goes in to each pint? Now, I had four pints mixed up. Four pints of paint was $76 without the paint. And that, that's without the paint. That's just the, the toners. I don't know what this nonsense means, but I know these little computer prints. The point I'm making, I'm going to get into this tomorrow or the next day, is one of these... Oh, this is the light blue one. One of these weighs about 17 times what this one is like, holy crow. And there's nothing in here, nothing. There's, there's probably, and this one is almost full. And what I didn't realize is in the real world of paint mixing, when they do real paint, 
the computer knows exactly how much pigment to put in each color, and each color is different. So now I've been mixing the pigment in my own way. I'm going to obviously put some sig dope in it. I've always just been adding pigment, adding pigment, adding pigment until a spray pattern is dry, and then figuring that's about it. Backing off, put a little more carrier in, and then I'm close, which I did with Mike's yellow, by the way. But now I've entered a new, a new era, a new level, or whatever, with that computer printout. When you buy your pigment, ask for the computer printout, and you can figure it out. Or you can do what I'm doing, is just, here's the pint can, the pigment's already in it, and I'll add Sig Light Coat. But instead of adding a full can, I'll add like two-thirds of a can, so there's more pigment per unit. And if it sprays dry, I'll just add a little clear. Anyway, more on that later. I got something really awesome to show you. This is awesome beyond your wildest dreams, even by my dreams. Now, this is my friend Gerald Champ and his woman, Tammy. And I was trying to explain to him, this is out in Pasco, by the way. I was trying to explain to him how to hotwire a bulldozer and how to steal a bulldozer, and, you know, because these people, uh, they're not living in a high-crime area. It was kind of new information to them. But anyway... Uh, and by the way, you put a big ring mark in a plain jar when you squeezed it. <laughs> anyway, Gerald's been sending me neat things like that Mustang, and he's making a rave Mustang with an awesome paint job. He promised me pictures, but check out what came in today's mail. Gerald, I have to pat you on the head. I, even I'm impressed. Tammy, thank you very much. Even I'm impressed with this package that came today. Look at the size of these pictures. These are big, I guess, from calendars or girly calendars or something. Here. Look at the size of these things. Oh, they're calendars. This came in today's mail from Gerald Champ. Look at this. Adamusco, eat your heart out. Look at this. I, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to have to find a way of hanging these in the bathroom, the bedroom, somewhere. This one, I just bought the paint. Just bought the paint. This one is kind of the camo brown and green. Unbelievable. This one, this is from the Ghost Squadron calendar. Again, I don't have the curl out of them from the tool. It's the clip wing one. This will be real helpful in making it. Look at this, the shield. The spinner matches that spinner that Adam Usko got. I'm telling you, this is just unbelievable. Jer, I have to tell you a million times, thanks. This one has the invasion stripes on the bottom only. That's a typical paint scheme, no invasion stripes. And his Mustang, he says, now I'm going to hold him to this. If anybody out there, this is General Champ's Mustang paint job. If he wimps out and does some kind of cheapy paint job, I'm going to have this hanging in my shop somewhere, and I'm going to refer to it. Gerald, Tammy, don't let him wimp out. He's got to go for the full paint job. So here I am. This is unbelievable. I'm buried in pictures. It's going to blow a whole night away because I'm going to be sitting around looking at these paint jobs and my color chips and my pigment and trying to figure out what I want to do for a paint job. And believe me, I still, even though I've bought the paint, I'm still undecided. So it's impossible. Spitfires are just so cool. There's so many things you can do with a Spitfire. Gerald, how's this for a place of honor? I mean, talk about the ultimate place of honor. Every time I go to the bathroom, I'm going to be looking at this Spitfire. <laughs> oh, I can't believe it. This is awesome pictures, Jer. Can't thank you enough. I'm going to hang them all up. Just unbelievable. thing of the night here before I pack it in. The dope has dried. I pulled off all the tape and tried to clean up the edges just a little bit and put a new set of tape on. The new set of tape is back maybe a thousandth of an inch. Just enough that I'm not building up a ridge there. I can keep this nice and smooth. I've also changed this line, moved this line up just a little bit from the original line Actually, I did it from looking at Gerald Shamp's pictures of the canopy and seeing that this line might have been a little too far down. 
have this up and I want to put the corner cuts in there now and the blue tape is good for the, for the bevels here. I also bought the tape while I was out of Troy too so. Now you can feel already as the dough hardens up everything gets nice and nice and firm so by tomorrow I hope this is ready to be sanded out a little bit. Again, I'm just putting a little bit of extra blue on the edges. And each time, or every couple of times, I put a coat of dope on this, or filler, or talc, I'll move the tape. So I'm constantly moving that line back. I don't have that, that razor line. And you can just get a little bit of sanding on the edge. Before I quit for the night, I'll put one extra coat of dope on here, right around the canopy edges. Now, with all the new tape on there, I sanded that all out. Boy, that's that's beautiful. Now, I just want to get, this is one of the, I guess one of the things a lot of people have a, they're not so sure about. They're always wanting to melt epoxy or put epoxy down in a tank to fuel proof it. Well, I figure if you fuel proof the outside of the plane with paint, you may as well fuel proof the inside with paint. You're not going to get any more oil on this part inside the tank box than you're going to get on the outside of the plank, so what the heck. So what I do is I hold it down, and this this is really a good trick too, no matter what, what design you have. And let's let everything flow down to the bottom, and then what I'll do is I'll take this over by the hook. Get plenty in there. Take it over by the hook or just hold it upside down and let whatever extra runs out, run out. Get up in here, up by the blind nuts the doublers, all this stuff, down in by the air vents. Now, years ago, I always thought it was important. I'd mix up a five-minute epoxy and pour it down there and try to fuel-proof it and everything, and I realized, well, what the hell? Every time I take a plane apart, there wasn't a drop of oil back there, so I guess it wasn't the end of the world. You just let that all run right down in there. Beautiful. Another reasonably good day. See you in the morning. Now today, this soap has been dry in 24 hours, and I just want to show, because a lot of people don't understand about how dope is. When dope is dry, it powders off. And I just want to do a little bit of this, maybe on the macro lens. I don't know if I can show this as accurately as I'd like to. This is what it should look like when the dope powders off. And that should be, now we're ready, actually right here, that's ready for tissue. But you can see it comes off just like powder. If it doesn't come off like powder, there's a chance it's not really dry yet and you should let it dry a little more now. What I did to, to beat the system a little bit is I turned the heat up to, um, to, don't tell Karen, I turned it up to 90 degrees the whole time this was drying. <clears throat> now at this point, one of the things that's real handy is a little piece of styrofoam, a little foam block, any shape. I just rip up a piece of an old wing core. I like to use this to get in some of the areas and around right up, for instance, with your bare finger, you can't get into the corners where the fillets are. Work these areas. I don't want to, <clears throat> obviously one of the things, and I always have trouble explaining this to people that I'm trying to help. You don't want to, the, the purpose is not to sand all the dope off. When you put the, the wet dope onto the wood, it expands, it changes shape, it resets the wood cells, especially on a spot that the, uh, the wood grain is kind of grainy to begin with. Now this has three, four, five, how many coats of dope you've put on. You want to just get off all the rough and high spots. But I don't want to take all the dope off. I don't want to sand this back down to raw wood. So the whole idea is just to get a nice flat surface to start with because I'd like to get some of the tissue done today if I possibly can. There's a couple ways you can ensure ensure that the dope underneath the tissue is adhered to the wood real good and it, it gives you a real cheap insurance policy that 
when you pull up the tape, you're not going to pull up the finish. And I'm sure everybody's done that from time to time. So the other thing, hey, just <clears throat> you can see I'm getting sick again from all this snow shoveling. A funny story, and this is absolutely true. I went when I got this paint from Charlotte. I was trying to get the light green color, and I got all the colors out of the book. And he said, "Well, the light green color, the Spitfire light green." Well, they don't have that color, so I had to pick an alternate color, but I had my original paint chip. So what happened is when Jimmy and George and I went to the restaurant for lunch, we were sitting in a restaurant, I look out across the street, I have the paint chip in my pocket, I take it out, I look, I hold it across the street, the house across the street is the color I wanted. The whole damn house is painted Spitfire Green. And that is absolutely true. Anyway, I'm going to sand this whole thing off camera. And then we'll get ready to start tissueing this up. This is really ready. And believe me, I'm, I'm very satisfied the way it's dried up. Last night I got a couple extra coats on this. I believe there's about five coats on here now. But the way it powders off, when it's powdering off like that, you know it's ready to go. Now, in the course of sanding out the fuselage, I put a ding in the trailing edge here. And I thought this would be a good time to show... Uh, what well, my technique for repairing this is. Now you know from time to time, if you have never done this, forget it, you're a liar. You put a ding in something, it either comes from a table edge, a belt buckle, whatever. This is just a typical thing that happens, and now I want to make this repair. I'm, I'm still sanding out the body here. I still have another half hour or so of sanding, but I want to get this piece in here and get some dope on it and get it so it's starting to dry. Now the first thing I do with any of these repairs is get the balsa wood, get some CA on a Q-tip. Whoop, let it kick off with the cotton there. Harden up the area around it. In this case that really won't be totally necessary because we have a finish around it. Let that harden up. Now I'll cut a piece of, try to find the hardest piece of balsa wood I can so that it's, you know, I certainly wouldn't want a punky piece that's going to be uh, hard to blend in. Since the surface around it is hard, I want a hard piece of wood so I can get a nice surface on this. Okay, a couple of things that will help you is always make the patch bigger than a piece around it. I don't want to put any filler in here if I possibly can help it, so I like to get the piece bigger. I'll trace this out, go sort off camera, leave it just a little bit oversized. And I'll have that little piece, it'll be thicker than the surface around it, and I'll try to sand it in. And notice the piece is bigger in all the, all the dimensions. I'm just letting that side put some CA on there. Let that CA kick off. No kicker. I don't want to make a popcorn festival out of this. And I'll just try to shave it down close. And boy, this, there's no end to the amount of dings you can put in a plane, but as long as you can fix them, it's not a complete tragedy. And the rest, I guess, I'll just sand in there. And this is rock hard balsa wood. Makes a good patch. Sanding block and some 320 is usually what I would dress this off with. And of course I'll flip it over and do the other side. Again, I remember years ago, and this is this is going back where I'd get a little ding in a plane or something and I'd panic. I'd say, oh my God, that's the end of the world. Uh, well, when you know you can repair up to a point and not, now this is in the outward tip, so who cares what this weighs even, but it gives you a lot of confidence and it's a good feeling to know you can repair these things. And sometimes you only have to see it once and you can figure the rest out now. Obviously you want to take some, some like 320 in a block, blend this right in, hit it with some thin CA, harden it up, get a couple of coats of filler on it, and in the final analysis, once it's silvered and everything, you will never even see this. Now 
good way to do this is just put the thin CA right on a Q-tip. Go out beyond, refers to Q-tip, go out beyond the area. Let the cotton in the Q-tips do the kicking. This will be ready for a coat of filler. I'll dust sand this off. Be ready for a coat of filler in, in two minutes. So not only is the repair invisible, but it's quick too. Now, if you did have some some deep spot in here that you really didn't fill in yet, you could use the green stuff, but this was almost a perfect patch. <sighs> Never even see that when it's done. Now, I'll shake that filler up real good. I think one coat of filler on that is all I'm going to need. And that can be drying while I'm sanding the rest of the body and tissue in the body. Good time management. We won't, we won't lose any time because of that patch. And just go back, go out over the area past where this is all going to be sanded down anyway. I give this two or three coats. Give it a half hour to dry in between coats. It'll be ready to go. Now remember this little spot out on a silk span? I had a blob of CA on here. I put a little bit of that green stuff, sanded it down with 1200, and I'm just going to brush on some filler here, as long as I'm doing filler patches. Get random sanding lines, random brush stroke. And while all that stuff is drying, I'm going to finish up all the sanding on the body. One of the steps you can leave out and, and trick yourself into thinking you're saving work here is you can not sand the first coat or clear out of the second coat or whatever. But when you tissue over this, what happens is you always have high spots in the tissue where you cut through. And it, this is just like pay me now or pay me later. It's really a good investment to get this done, get all the edges radius again, all the edges around the cowl. Boy, I wish I could shake this cold. Unbelievable. This thing has plagued me for the whole winter here. All the edges. Now I'm going to get ready here. We're going to be finished with this soon. I want to use medium silt span. I want to get the, the coat of clear that's going to hold the silt span on to have a little bit extra thinner in it so I get some good penetration. And if you tend to work real slow, you could always put a little retarder in the clear even just to give you some extra time to work on it. But this, this is powdered off real nicely. Want to get right into fillets. I also want to get right up to the fillet, that part that we just put an extra coat of clear on, a couple coats of clear. Again, there's no magic formula. The, for, the magic formula is to put three coats on, two coats, one on. Put enough on that the body has a little bit of a shine. Now you know that the silk span's got something to bind onto. The dumbest thing in the world is to put one or two coats on and then think that's enough. You put the silk span on. When you're all done with the finish, you pull up the tape, bingo, up comes the finish. And that happens even when you do things right sometimes. So why fool around? A little bit of extra paint here is going to ultimately work its way up through the tissue. There's no, there's no negative side to this. Anyway, I'm going to get the rest of this done off camera and get ready. Hopefully, we get a lot done today. Hopefully get ready. Another thing too, don't look at things. At this point in time, everything looks terrible. The silver's all scratched. This is terrible to patch this. Don't look at it. Feel it. Your, your hands are much more sensitive to little, like right in here. And I would never see that with my eyes. Your hands are more sensitive to little imperfections. From this point in the finish on, it's your hands that have to tell you where it needs to be sanded. You really can't depend on your eyes until it's all one color again, or silver. When, when it's all silver, now you can depend on your eyes, but you can't depend on your eyes now. Now another thing I was looking at, I was wondering if these real thin shells were going to warp or twist or whatever. So far they've been perfect, so I'm just, just holding my breath here. Hoping that this is going to be... When it's all tissued out, I'm not going to have any of those starving horse wrinkles or anything in there. 
Now another thing, I'm just thinking of things that I just put another gouge in, you're not going to be impressed with this, I just put another gouge in the body. What happened is I was sanding over here and the sandpaper wrinkled up on a corner and put a gouge in the fuse. At this point in time I'm just going to put a little bit of dap in there. I'll do that off camera, but always watch when the sandpaper gets a wrinkle in it, lose it, get a new piece of sandpaper. A wrinkled piece of sandpaper does more damage than it does good. You can really put, no, I don't even want to say it, how much damage you can do. And especially if you're not watching now, and if, in years gone by, I used to watch football games and things like that when I'd be sanding. I'd be watching, oh yeah, there's Phil Sims, yeah, 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 and all of a sudden I had 400 swirls in the damn paint. So I'll try to get to the point where I look at it and feel it. Always the feel, your hands. Your hands always, and that gouge is right there. I ought to show it on the camera. See, this is, this is the sandpaper gouge I just put in here. Now, I'll take a little dap and just fill that in real quick. Real quick. That'll dry in two seconds and I can sand it out. But that's from wrinkled up sandpaper. You get wrinkled up sandpaper, lose it. Just get rid of it. I'm just going to dust this all off and we're pretty much going to be ready to, I sand it out the little repair, the little tissue repair, wipe this all down with a uh, clean paper towel and we'll be ready. We're going to be ready to tissue this body. Now a couple of common sense things that I like to do before I do any kind of big job, big tissuing job get a nice clean sheet out of the laundry, get the table nice and clean, vacuum the floor. I'm going to be using this table to cut the tissue. I certainly don't want to start off with a pile of dust and chips. And I've had other people in the shop here, good time not to mention any names that way, come down, okay, let's tissue the body. Boom, and there's all dust, chips, razor blades, junk all over the table. Then they wind up getting that under the tissue and there's little bubbles and oh God. A nice clean work area to start with. Number one priority. And that little repair worked out perfectly. Just perfect. <laughs> Some of these other little repairs, when you run your hand over them, you can't even feel them. And I think that's a significant thing, even though this looks terrible. And of course, if you accept the fact this is going to look terrible, it won't bother you. But a lot of people, and I've had, I won't mention any names again, it's embarrassing. Embarrassing for me. Oh, the plane looked terrible. I painted it itself. It looked down. I wanted to throw it away anymore. Well, don't worry. When it's all smooth, if you're constantly using your hand around here, around here, your hand is not going to lie. Your hand is not going to give any false sense of security here. All of these little things, believe it or not, if you close your eye and rub your hand over them, you can't feel them at all. And that's the that's. I guess the single most important lesson learned is use your hand, not, don't use your eye at this point in time until a plane is back in silver, and from that point on, maybe you can reasonably use your eye, but at this point in time, get used to looking at all these pock marks and repairs and everything, because once the next coat of silver goes on there and it's all finalized and sanded out with 1200, it's going to look beautiful. Hard to envision it now, but it will look beautiful, believe me. Now, no matter what you do, no matter how you do it, there's always what's called the approach. The approach in this case is we're ready to tissue the body, but I have a couple little spot, a little pieces, this little hatch, which I've put the all of the clear on. I'm going to sand all these little pieces out, get a radius. I have this piece, I have the little scoop, I have the rudder. And a good idea anytime you're going to tissue, anytime you're going to do anything that requires a skill that you've already gotten is do a little practice run. Now what's nice is these little pieces, the rudder also, these amount to be nice practice things. 
if you're going to have a little bit of a clumsy hand in the beginning of it, let it be on the rudder, on the hatch, on the scoop, on something else. Then when you get, you kind of get in motion and you get ready to go and everything feels comfortable, the dope has the right amount of thinner in it, you have the heat turned up in the house, you have all these things going for you, then you're ready to do the mainframe. Now, the mainframe, we don't have enough tape left on this tape, so I'm going to do these little pieces now and save this for the next tape. This is a rather complex thing, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. A lot of people try to use as few joints as possible. I really don't care how many joints are on here. In fact, a lot of places like around a canopy, I want double and triple tissue up around here. The joints sand out. It just takes a little more effort. A lot of people are very careful and get the joints all cute and very... I don't think it's that critical of a thing, as long as you have tissue covering everything. The tissue adds a tremendous amount of strength. It adds torque resistance to the body. It adds strength to the nose. Every way you put tissue, it's adding strength. There's probably no other material, and I'll even say carbon fiber, that adds the amount of strength per weight that the tissue does. I really feel the tissue adds an incredible amount of strength. I've taken a body before I've tissued it, wiggled the tail. Yeah, now this one is pretty strong already, but ones that were kind of flimsy, tissued the body with medium tissue and all the dope and gotten them up to silver, all of a sudden they're rigid as can be. Oh my God. That tissue is adding a lot of strength. Another example is just take an I-beam wing before you tissue it. <laughs> oh my God, it's a pretzel. Tissue it, couple of coats of dope, bong. So, important thing to remember, the tissue is not just a cosmetic thing, it's something that actually does the work. Alright, I'm going to sand this off camera, get these tissue, get in mode, and on the next tape we'll pick up the body. Now you might be, you might be thinking, oh well, I'll use double O tissue and boy I'll save some weight. Well, in any testing I've done, by the time you add all the dope and sand through in spots like you tend to do with double O, no saving at all. In fact, a lot of times it can be heavier because you've got so much dope to fill in all the spots that you normally sand through. Now, I try to do this on some kind of a rag towel. The reason being is the tissue tends to absorb all the Windex. I do soak, not soak, just make it damp with Windex. Again, this is why I always do a little test. I put even a little more thinner in this dope. Give me a little working time here. I've got the heat in the house turned up to the moon. Karen would have a heart attack if she saw how hot it was in here. What this does, it gets everything dry and real nice. You get a lot of the moisture out of the air. Again, I always test on little parts. It's no secret at all. You do the little parts. Now, for instance, right now, if I saw this was drying too fast or whatever, I could add a little thinner. If I say it was taking too long to dry, yeah, I could put a little more uh, light coat into this mixture, but I really, really, really suggest always do your little test on your little parts. No matter what you do, test on the little parts. I rub this down with my fingers, bare hands. I know that doesn't uh, sit well with a lot of people, but press it right down. When you push it down, the dope oozes up out of the tissue. You tend to get rid of all the extra dope that's under the tissue and you get a good bind. Now just by running back and forth, and of course, this is why I like to, I like to just get in mode here. This is a brand new scalpel blade. Double edge razors work well. Normally you could let this dry and then trim it off. I want to just see how this is going to dry up for my own purposes. Now there's a lot of spots on the plane where I want to put double tissue up around the nose where the uh, where the motor mounts kind of stick out through the blocks, through the shells. That's a good spot. Where the joints are, where we cut the, the body away to make room for the wing, that's a good spot for double tissue. And along the seams of the turtle deck, another good spot. Now, in the amount of time, and the reason I'm doing this all on camera is to show how much time this really sh should take. Get around the edges here. Press that down. Right now, that's dry to the touch. Now, best thing to do is let this dry 10, 15 minutes. 
put another coat of dope on. Don't just keep saturating it if you can. This gives everything underneath a little time to dry out. And while this is drying, I'll work on the rudder. Let me get the rudder. I can do the same thing here. Cut up a little patch. These are all the scraps, by the way, that are left over. That's just a nice handy way to do it. Put a little notch in for the horn. Again, I'll get all my little techniques that I just feel real comfortable with everything. This looks right, by the way. But not always. Don't think this always happens. This A lot of times you do this and you have to go back and remix the paint four or five times, put more thin or less thin or whatever, until you're real comfortable with it. If you're doing it over a towel, it's real nice. The towel absorbs any of the extra Windex. You don't want to soak it. Again, just make it down. All you really have to do is see this technique once. The Windex evaporates a lot, quick, a lot quicker than water. That's the reason for using Windex. And especially while we're working on the body, I don't want to have... There's so many curves and I have to do it in like 40 or 50 pieces. So I'd like to, uh, you know, get it moving right along. I don't want to sit and wait for each piece to dry 10 minutes. It'll take me all day to do it. Normally it takes me two or three hours to do a body the way I like to do it. I don't want it to take 10. I'm assuming you haven't sanded through any spots here. If you have, you want to put a little bit of extra dope on. Again, we're sneaking up on the end of this tape. I'm just going to let the camera run till the end of the tape. But if you get that philosophy down, a lot of times with some modeling technique, you really only have to see the technique. The rest of it you can figure out yourself. You don't need a step-by-step. -step. You just need like a little road map. Now you wouldn't believe it. There's another storm coming this way. Oh, man. Anyway, for all the things that you can't control in life, one of the things you can control is the time and energy you put into the modeling. And, and I put what I feel is a, a large amount of my life into this. And I really do enjoy seeing the results come out as well as I can. And I enjoy, just like those pictures General Champ sent in, and Midgley working on his stuff, and Jimmy's going to be back in mode soon. John DeTavio should be better soon. He's been sick. We should all be getting some new projects going in the shop here real soon. Next Monday night there'll be a class. We'll be back in mode after what was a real long layoff. Swiftfire bathroom. Yeah. 